Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Forward Progress Football Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Party, and today we're going to be continuing our Who Are They series with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Let's get right on into it. Alright, so before we get things started, um, first off, I'm about to hit 50 subscribers, which, you know, small number, but hey, about to get there, that's pretty cool. Um, Help me out, hit the subscribe button if you haven't right now, only 14% of you guys are subscribed, so if just a couple of you guys hit that, then I'm going to hit 50 in no time. Secondly, um, my Houston Texans video a couple videos back hit the most views of any video on my channel, and I said if anyone gets the most views and likes, I will be giving away a hoodie, so now I just need one to get the most likes. If someone, or if one of my videos hits 17 likes, someone in the comment section of that video will win a free hoodie looks like this i'll hopefully put a picture in if i remember i hopefully do <laughs> anyways um with all that out of the way it's time to kick things off with the jacksonville jaguars um pretty excited about this team to talk about it it's a very interesting team with a lot of ups and downs they did have the number one overall pick for the last two seasons in a row and speaking of that we're going to get into the quarterbacks where they have trevor lawrence cj bethard jake lutton and ej perry so trevor lawrence had a disappointing rookie season the number one overall pick from last year's draft was heralded as the next great quarterback prospect from the moment he stepped on foot at Clemson's campus. However, no one could have predicted that he would have ended up with a mess that was Urban Meyer's Jags. He showed some flashes like an impressive performance despite zero touchdowns in, uh, versus the Bengals in a narrow week four loss and then a hilarious week 18 victory to keep the Colts out of the playoffs. However, he also had flashes of pretty terrible play, like weeks 9 through 16, where he threw one touchdown and five interceptions. But also, to be fair, four of those did come in one outing. Hopefully, now removed from the Urban Meyer drama and with a better coach and team around him, Lawrence can start to look like um, what many saw as a generational prospect. Beathard saw a good amount of snaps for the Niners during his four years there as a backup for the oft-injured Jimmy Garoppolo. The 2017 third-round pick never played terribly, but he didn't look necessarily good in what was one of the most quarterback-friendly situations with Kyle Shanahan and the Niners. Lutton was drafted in the sixth round of 2020, and he saw the field during the Tank for Trevor games, where he started off looking good, throwing for 300 yards and one touchdown and a pick, but then threw one touchdown to five picks over the next two starts. He'll likely just be a career backup for now. Um, And then Perry is an undrafted free agent out of Brown from this class. For running backs, they have James Robinson, Travis Etienne Jr., Snoop Connor, Ryquel Armstead, Nathan Cottrell, and Makai Sargent. Robinson came in as an undrafted free agent in 2020 and looked like a player who definitely should have been drafted. He had over 1,000 yards and 7 touchdowns on the ground to go with 300 yards and 3 touchdowns through the air. However, for whatever reasons, Urban Meyer sought to replace him. I wouldn't be surprised if it were because of something like his drafted position, or lack thereof, or some other weird reason that Meyer came up with. Either way, he saw 80 less carries, but did have a higher yards per carry last season. He should still be this team's number one runner, but could see a lot less snaps with a healthy ETN in play. ETN was drafted in the first round last year out of Clemson to go along with Trevor Lawrence. Meyer saw him as a gadget player, someone who's going to line up, line up out wide in the slot and in the backfield. With the new regime, it'll be interesting to see if he is still going to be used this way, as then it would allow him and Robinson to see the field at the same time. If ETN stays healthy all season, I do expect him to take Robinson's RB1 job by the end of the year, but either way, I think these two are going to be a great duo. Connor was drafted in the 5th round this year and had a productive final season at Ole Miss with 4.9 yards per carry and 13 touchdowns. Armstead was drafted in the 5th round of 2019, but hasn't seen too much action since his rookie year, where he had 100 yards on the ground and 100 more through the air. Cottrell went undrafted in 2020, but has hardly seen the field so far. Sargent went undrafted last year and saw a few snaps for the Rams and the Titans before ending up in Jacksonville. For wide receivers, they have Christian Kirk, Marvin Jones Jr., Zay Jones, LaVisca Chenault Jr., Laquan Treadwell, Jamal Agnew, Tim Jones, Jeff Cotton Jr., Marvin Hall, Kevin Austin Jr., Lawan Winningham, Willie Johnson, and Ryan McDaniel. 
So Kirk's monster contract changed the wide receiver market forever. The former second round pick was a decent number three for Arizona and had a breakout year last year, playing primarily from the slot and being their number two target. However, last year's total of 984 yards was his career high and he only topped 100 yards in one game last season. He's got a lot to prove to this season to make people not question his high price tag. Marvin Jones Jr. has been a solid number two type receiver throughout his career with Cincinnati and Detroit. However, now that he's 32 years old, how much longer can he stay productive and can he be enough if asked to be the number one for this team? Zay Jones had a solid season for the Raiders who ended up leaning on him more when Ruggs got arrested and Waller was in and out of the lineup with injuries. He had a game-winning touchdown in week one against the Ravens and stepped up big against the Colts with 120 yards to keep them in playoff contention. But outside those two games, he had 380 yards and no touchdowns on the season, despite being active every game. Somehow, this performance earned him a three-year, $24 million contract from Jacksonville. The NCAA's single-season and all-time reception leader still has upside at only 27 years old, but there is a lot of projecting to put him as anything more than a four, maybe a number three. Chenault was seen as a gadget-type player, Um, drafted in the second round of the 2020 draft. He is best after the catch, and many thought that he'd play what is now the D-Row role, flexing between running back and wideout, especially when ETN went down with injuries last year. However, he only took 16 backfield snaps last season. He will only be 24 in October, so he has a lot of his career left ahead of him, and has shown flashes of a higher upside number two type receiver, but has yet to put it all together. I wouldn't be surprised to see him higher up on the death chart by the end of the season, though I also wouldn't be surprised if he hardly saw the field here. Treadwell was a disappointing first rounder for the Vikings back in 2016. However, he had a decent season here in Jacksonville. He is buried on the depth chart, but does have the chance to get a couple hundred yards if he can beat out a guy or two above him. Agnew was a return specialist and was used as a gadget player last year with 200 yards and a touchdown through the air, as well as another 100 yards and a touchdown on 15.9 yards per carry. There are some other gadget type players ahead of him though with ETN coming back and then Chenault having a higher upside at that position, so he may just be relegated to a return specialist once again. Jones went undrafted last year but didn't play at all. Cotton went undrafted two years ago and saw one snap last year. Hall went undrafted in 2016 and had a decent two-year stretch in 2019 and 2020 with 550 yards and three touchdowns as a deep threat but didn't do much last year. And then Austin Jr., Winningham, Johnson, and McDaniel are all UDFAs from this class. So for tight ends, they have Evan Ingram, Dan Arnold, Chris Manhurts, Luke Farrell, Garrett Prince, Naz Bohannon, and Grayson Gunter. Ingram looked great his rookie season with the Giants in 2017 with 700 yards and 6 touchdowns. However, he also had 11 drops, which have continued to plague his career. At 6'3", 240 with 4'4 speed, he's more receiver than tight end, but he only has a 34% career contested catch rate and a 10% drop percentage. He needs to fix both of those numbers if he wants to continue to be a starting tight end. Dan Arnold went undrafted in 2017 and has bounced around the league as a receiving tight end. At 6'6", 220, he is also practically a receiver, so it'll be interesting to see how these two tight ends will be used together. Um, In Ingram's rookie season, he did line up in line more than in the slot, so maybe they're going to go back to doing that here in Jacksonville. Manhurts went undrafted in 2015 and has been a pretty decent blocking tight end, mostly for Carolina and then last year with Jacksonville. Farrell was drafted in the 5th last year and saw a bit of time early on, but didn't produce much and hardly played down the line. And then Prince, Bohannon, and Gunter are all UDFAs from this season. So along their offensive line, their starters project to be Cam Robinson, Ben Barch, Tyler Shotley, Brandon Scherf, and Jawan Taylor with Walker Little, Badara Treor, Will Richardson Jr., and Corey Cronk backing up at tackles, Casey McDermott, Wes Martin, and Jared Hawker backing up at guard, and Luke Fortner and Nick Ford backing up at center. 
Robinson has been one of the worst starting tackles since being picked in the second round back in 2017. So, naturally, the Jags gave him $54 million over three years. To be fair, he did look much better last year, giving up 31 pressures, which is only 12 which only 12 tackles who played as much or more than him surrendered. Hopefully this was the start of a breakout for him and he can turn into a solid starter, but that is yet to be seen. Little made a couple of starts at left tackle when Robinson was down last year and didn't look too bad for a second round rookie. He will likely start for this team down the line, um, probably now at right tackle though with Robinson locked up for the next few years. Barch started most of week 5 through 18 and had a couple couple good starts in there and a couple pretty bad ones. The 2020 fourth rounder is lined up to win the starting gig again this year, but it definitely should be a competition. McDermott went undrafted in 2018 and saw his first snaps last year when Barch was out in week 17, so he'll push him for the job once again. Shatley went undrafted in 2014 with the Jags, sticking around the whole time as a guard and center, um, starting a bunch of games last year at center, but not looking too hot there. Fortner was drafted in the third round last year out of Kentucky and had a very solid shot to be the starter this year. Hopefully he can win this job sooner rather than later and bring some of that bully ball mentality. And then Ford is a UDFA from this season. Scherf has been an elite guard since being taken 5th overall in 2015 with Washington. He was injured a bit last year, so hopefully he can stay healthy and be a top guard again this year. Martin was drafted in the 4th round in 2019 by the Commanders, but hasn't played well in the limited snaps he has gotten there. Hawker went undrafted last year, but didn't play. And then Taylor also has been one of the worst tackles since being drafted in the 2nd round, but taken in 2019 instead of 2017 like Robinson. He has improved in year three last year, surrounding 34 pressures, which was tied for ninth out of tackles who played 80% or more of their team's pass blocking snaps. Richardson was drafted in the fourth round in 2018 and has played mostly guard, but is listed as a backup tackle. He'll likely compete for the left guard spot and the swing tackle role with Walker Little. And then Kronk went undrafted last year and didn't play. Along their interior defensive line, they have Lorenzo Faducasi, Roy Robertson-Harris, Malcolm Brown, Devon Hamilton, Adam Gotsis, Raekwon Williams, Jeremiah Ledbetter, Jay Tufaeli, and Israel Antwine. Faducasi is one of the better nose tackle run stuffers in the league, getting a well-deserved paycheck to bring his talent here to Jacksonville to help bolster this run D. Um, he provides a bit against the pass, but is mostly brought here because of what he can do against the run. Robertson Harris is a pass rushing focused interior lineman who can also kick outside on rundowns. He should be a nice complement to Fadakasi's run stuffing per hours. Brown is also a primary run defending type, but like many who have left the Patriots, he had his worst year last year with Jacksonville. He still should see a lot of early down um, run snaps though next to Fadakasi, uh, but there is also Hamilton who was taken in the third round in 2020 and has seen more rundowns than pass so far. So it will. It is likely he's going to get in that rotation, especially if Brown continues to decline. Godsis was drafted in the second round in 2016 by the Broncos, but never lived up to that billing. He is a bit undersized to be great against the run, and his most pressures in the season is 16. Williams went undrafted in 2020, but hasn't really seen the field too much yet. Ledbetter was drafted in the 6th round in 2017 by the Lions and has bounced around the league, not really playing at all last year. Uh, Tuffa Eli was drafted in the 4th last year and hardly saw the field. Hopefully you can start to see the field more as he does have the highest upside here as a pass rusher from the inside outside of Robertson Harris. And then Antwine is a UDFA from this class. For edge defenders, they have Josh Allen, Trayvon Walker, Dwayne Smoot, Arden Key, Kayla Von Chason, Wyatt Ray, Jameer Jones, Rashad Berry, and Deshaun Dixon. Allen had a great season for a rookie in 2019 with 12 sacks off of 49 pressures, but was out for most of 2020. Last year, he finished with 50 pressures, but only 8 sacks. He has shown flashes of high upside play, so can this be the year where he unlocks his potential? Trayvon Walker was the number one overall pick this year. He wasn't the most productive at Georgia while playing alongside many other first rounders, though. 
Um, many point to his usage, and that due to his athletic ability being 6'5", 270, with 4'5", uh, 40, and a 6'8", 9, 3 cone, he was asked to be a contained guy to make sure that the quarterbacks didn't sp- scramble too much versus just a pure pass rusher. He needs a lot of refinement as a pass rusher, but physically speaking, he has the upside to be the league's best. It's just a question on if this Jacksonville coaching staff can bring that out of him. He should be solid against the run right away, though. Smoot had a breakout year last year, posting 50 pressures and 7 sacks. He's a good third rusher who can also kick inside a bit. Key was a disappointing third-round pick for the Raiders in 2018, but had a good year as a rotational rusher with the Niners last year, um, totaling 36 pressures and 8 sacks. He's also able to kick inside a bit on passing downs. Chason has not been good during his first two seasons. The former first-round pick was seen as a high upside developmental speed rusher type, but the old staff could never help him reach his upside. Hopefully, this new group can help unlock him more, as well as um, Trayvon Walker. Ray went undrafted in 2019 and saw some time last year's rotational guy in Cincinnati. Jones went undrafted in 2020 and got a few snaps with three different squads last year, including with Jacksonville in Week 18 or Week 17. Um, Barry went undrafted in 2020 and hasn't played too much yet, and Dixon is a UDFA from this season. For linebackers, they have Foyasada Luakun, Devin Lloyd, Chad Buma, Shaquille Quarterman, Chappelle Russell, Tyrell Adams, and Grant Morgan. Luakun has been a good linebacker for Atlanta, improving each year since being drafted in the sixth round in 2018, and doing even better than Deion Jones did last year. He got a large payday to come here, so let's hope he can he can continue to develop, but he should be good, especially when playing next to some talented young guys. Lloyd is a great all-around linebacker and should be an immediate difference maker, even as a rookie. The first round pick excelled in coverage against the run and also was a great blitzer, even lining up as a full-on pass rusher at times. Muma has a lot of upside coming from Wyoming as a third round pick. With talent ahead of him, he may not see a lot of snaps as he adjusts from the Mountain West to the NFL competition, but he's shown the potential of an elite cover linebacker, and at 6'3", 240, he should be good enough against the run, especially with NFL training. It was a bit confusing for them to spend another premium pick on linebacker after drafting one in the third round and signing a little cunt to big money, so we'll have to see what the plan for him is here. Quarterman was drafted in the fourth round in 2020 and saw some snaps in rotation last year, but never starting. If Muma can't get up to speed right away, he'll likely see a lot of early down one snaps as the third linebacker. Russell was drafted in the seventh round in 2020 by the Bucks, and then played a handful of snaps last year for the Jags, including one start. Adams went undrafted in 2015, and his only starting year was in 2020 with Houston, not looking good there. Morgan is a UDFA from this class. So for cornerbacks, they have Darius Williams, Shaquille Griffin, Tyson Campbell, Chris Claybrooks, Xavier Crawford, Trey Herndon, Rudy Ford, Gregory Jr., Monteriac Brown, Shabari Davis, Josh Thompson, and Benji Franklin. Williams went undrafted in 2018 and is only 5'9". Despite that, he started these past two seasons for the Rams and looked pretty good, great there. Of course, it helps with Ramsey following their number one and having Donald force the ball out fast, but he still looked like one of the best corners in the league. Hopefully, despite his size, Jacksonville will keep him on the outside where he's thrived. Griffin was drafted in the third round in 2017 by the Seahawks and signed with Jacksonville last year. Ideally, he's your number two, which he can be here with Williams, but he has shown some flashes of some number one type play, so it's a great asset for the Jags. Campbell had a good rookie season for a second round pick who was forced to start right away. He showed some nice flashes, but it is a question on how much he will play or even where he will play as these top three guys so far have been outside corners. If they want to have their best guys on the field at once, one of them will need to learn how to play slots. So who's that going to be? Clay Brooks was drafted in the seventh round in 2020 and has seen a good amount of snaps at the outside and last slot. So he'll likely compete for that slot role in case none of these guys are able to step inside. Crawford has been a backup slot for Chicago these past years, not looking the best there when he's got some time. Jags picked up Herndon as an undrafted free agent in 2018, and he's been starting for them since 2019. He's disappointed on the outside, so they moved him inside where he arguably looked worse and got benched. 
Ford has bounced around since being taken in the sixth round by the Cardinals in 2017. Last year, he saw significant snaps in the slot for the Jags and didn't play too bad, so he'll compete for the job once again. Junior was drafted in the sixth round, and then Brown was drafted in the seventh this year, with Tom Davis, Thompson, and Franklin all being UDFAs from this class. So all these late round and UDFAs signal to me that they don't really trust their depth here, which, honestly, I don't really blame them. So for safeties, they have Rashawn Jenkins, Andre Sisko, Andrew Wingard, Daniel Thomas, Brandon Rusnak, and Ayo Oyelola. Jenkins has been a solid starter for the Chargers, and then last year here in Jacksonville. He can play both over top and in the box, so that versatility makes him a good complementary safety, but probably best as a number two or number three type. It took a while for Cisco to see the field, as Urban Meyer apparently was unaware of. I don't know if you guys saw that interview, just one of the many things about Urban Meyer that was weird, but... Once Cisco did start seeing the field, he started to show that upside that got him drafted in the third round last year. He's a risk-taking free safety that will lead to some big plays, but can also be caught out of position. If he can receive good coaching and take advantage of his elite speed, he should be a great safety here. Wingard went undrafted in 2019 and started at free safety. Um, Cisco has much higher upside though, so you hope that Cisco wins that starting job, but Wingard has proven to be a pretty average starting safety which you could do a lot worse with thomas was picked in the fifth round in 2020 and has seen a couple hundred snaps so far but it's likely a number four safety here unless cisco just absolutely does not develop and then oh Oye, yeah lola is a undrafted free agent who's part of the nfl's international program so we'll see if he can make the roster here and rustic went undrafted in 2019 um, not really seeing the field too often, mostly in 2020, but not looking good so far in his career. So for special teams, they have Ryan Santoso and Andrew Mevis competing for kicker, Logan Cook at punter, and Ross Matisic at long snapper. Santoso went undrafted in 2018 as a kicker, but also attempted a few field goals for the Panthers and the Lions last year but he only hit 75% of his PATs and 80% of his field goals, so they also have undrafted free agent Andrew Mevis here to compete. Cook was picked in the 7th round in 2018 and has been a pretty great punter for the Jags, having a net of over 44 yards per punt last year. Matisic has been with the Jags as their long snapper since going undrafted in 2020. Alright, so now we're going to get into the season projections where I go over their um, floor and their ceiling, um, everything that can really go wrong with the team, everything that can go right instead, what their over under is, whether or not I think you should bet the over or the under, um, and then this roster's biggest strength and weakness. Stick around with me till the end of the series. I'm also going to be doing a whole season projection for the entire league, giving my official win totals as well as a playoff prediction and um, the awards predictions. So, I think this team, you can tell by the six-win gap um, between their floor and their ceiling, their floor being 3-13 and 13 and their ceiling being 9-8, and eight, in case you're on the audio version. Um, I think this team has one of the widest range of outcomes for any NFL team. And this is almost purely on the backs of Trevor Lawrence being here. If he looks bad in the year or two, this team is not going to be good and could be picking number one for the third straight year. If Trevor is bad, this running game won't be able to carry this offense. These wide receivers don't look good, and Kirk and Jones look like complete overpays out there. Ingram could keep struggling with drops, and Arnold could be just like an alright receiving tight end, which isn't going to cut it. Um, this offensive line could really be a mess out of Scherf, with no truly established guys. This defense should be fine against the run, but they could really struggle to generate pressure with no one really threatening in the middle and their young edge rushers being unable to step up and generate pressure. Aluakun could look bad in a new environment. We see that a lot, and we also see a lot of rookie linebackers step in and struggle in year one. Um, these corners, they could look fine on the outside, but they don't really have anyone to play the slot, and then over top, Cisco really needs to develop for the safety room to look good, And but he could be playing with too much risk and not enough reward. However, this team does have enough upside, I think, to be above a 500 team, and that is because an elite quarterback could change everything, and that's what Trevor Lawrence could provide. 
He could take advantage of these these running backs in the pass game and help lighten the box for them in the run. Um, These wide receivers, they can hit their upside or at least close to it while still likely being overtime overpays they can at least provide much better play than what was here last year Ingram and arnold have the potential to be a pretty good receiving duo at tight end um, robinson and taylor continue to look better after horrendous starts through their career and hopefully they can get above bottom third play at left guard and center whoever is there um, they they could somehow manage to find some pass rush from the interior whether it's like robinson harris and um, to a lefe or they just kick some guys inside some edge rushers and um, Allen and Walker they could look like a great young edge rush duo Aluakun could still look great in this new environment and Lloyd can be one of those line records that just hits the ground running one of their top three cornerbacks could be able to kick inside and play pretty good making that a great trio and Cisco can start reaching his potential as this elite ball hawking free safety so their over ender is set higher than what I expected, honestly. I was ready to say bet the over if it was like 4.5 or 5.5, which is what I thought when looking uh, looking it up. Um, in case you're wondering, I do do the floor and the ceiling before I even look at what Vegas thinks because I, I don't want to be like influenced by that. Um, but I think Lawrence should look much better this year and keep them in a lot of games. I'm still going to say bet the over. It is a lot riskier at 6.5, but... I still believe in Lawrence. Like this guy was a generational prospect at Clemson, and you see a lot of quarterbacks coming and turn franchises around pretty fast recently. Um, and Lawrence definitely has the potential to do that. Um, I think they should be able to sneak a couple of games that, on paper, they shouldn't win. And then for their biggest strength, I put Trevor Lawrence. Like it's got to be the golden boy. He's what gives this team the most hope to win games and has truly elite upside. And just buying into him and believing in him should be a strength because this roster is going to play harder for him and if he's good that's obviously the most important thing um every strength on this roster though is a projection because i was obviously considering other positions like edge they have the number one overall pick but that's a projection on whether or not he's good like a lot of people are calling that a bust or reach already um linebackers they have two rookies there and a new guy from another team the secondary is heavily reliant on some um, young guys developing like Tyson Campbell and Andre Sisko. And so I think out of all those options that it could say as a strength, Lawrence is most likely the one that's going to be a true like strength for this team. And then for their biggest weakness, I put their offensive line. While it should be better this year, fingers crossed, I'm still concerned that this offensive line could get this offense in a lot of trouble. Robinson and Taylor definitely took strides last year, and little is there to step in in case one of these guys can't perform. But the only position where I'm confident where at least average level play is going to be provided is left guard, who should provide elite level play. I honestly almost put receiver here, though, um, but I don't think the receivers are going to quite hold them back like I think the offensive line could. It's more that with how much money that they've invested there... I think the receiver should be a strength, like if you just look at it, but I don't think that they will be, and I'm worried that they won't invest in this position next year, um, thinking that they're just fine there, you know? All right, so that's going to do it for today's episode. Let me know what you think. If you're on YouTube, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Remember, if you comment, you can win one of these free hoodies. Pretty sick deal. Why not just try for it? Um, Plus, help me reach my goal of 17 likes, 50 subscribers. If you're on audio... Um, Wherever you're listening to this, leave it a five-star review. It helps me out a lot trying to get it spread out. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time.